Hey there everybody, how's it going? Yes, it is time for another edition of Perry's Splendor 2013. This time we're covering through everything I picked up during the month of April. Also, I have a couple of announcements or little updates that I want to get you guys filled in on. So stick around to the end of this video so you find out what those are. Now with that said, let's go ahead and get to the games, movies, and anime that I picked up during this month. Also, I apologize in advance if this video comes out a little bit later than normal, only because a certain someone here forgot to charge the battery for the camera. Yeah, smart move on my part. Anyways, let's go ahead and get started. Now the first thing I have uh, picked up is a game that I was very curious about, or I didn't even know existed, based on an anime that I watched the OBA for, and I actually really enjoyed, surprisingly, and that is Black Rock Shooter the Game, and I have this on my PS Vita. So, and like I said before, I really enjoyed the OVAs. I was very curious about Black Rock Shooter because when I went to the last anime con, I think it was A-Fest back in September last year? I don't know. It's been a while. And I saw all these different figures of Black Rock Shooter just lying around the convention center, and I was just thinking, what is this character? Who is she? And nobody I talked to knew who this character was. And so I did my research, and it was like, it's called Black Rock Shooter. The character herself is called that. And so I dived a little bit further to see if there's any way I could watch this, and I found out that there was an OVA, a TV series. I don't know if there's anything else for Black Rock Shooter, like if there's an actual manga or something like that. And then I found out that there was a game for it, and I was like, there's no way this game's going to come over to the States. And lo and behold, I turns out to be wrong, that in fact it just came out, and so I've been playing around with it, and I'm actually kind of surprised at how much I'm enjoying it. I mean, it's nothing like super spectacular, but it is something I, well, I, ex I did not expect to enjoy as much as I have. I've already sunk about five hours into this thing, and so just having a chance to mess around with something that usually doesn't come around that often is actually kind of interesting. Now, I would describe the gameplay to you guys just to give an idea what this is like, but honestly, I'm having a hard time trying to sum up exactly how the gameplay setup works. I mean, if I, I mean, once I get done with this game, I'll do a full review of it and tell you exactly in detail how the gameplay works. But for now, I'm actually having a lot of fun with Black Rock Shooter. Hope I don't know how far into the game, like I'm towards completing it, but I would assume I'm probably about. I've already dealt with the first three bosses relatively easily. And I would say I'm about maybe a third of the way through the game, so if it's like five hours, th one third, it was, yeah, probably about 15 hours, who knows. But even still, glad that I'm playing this on the Vita, have a chance to have some mess around with this and give it a workout. I'm surprised at how many handheld games I've actually been playing this year. I mean, I've been going through Tales of the Abyss, Fire Emblem Awakening, I plan to pick up the Shin Megami Tensei games once those come out, or I should say Shin Megami Tensei 4, there we go. Uh, I heard Soul Hackers is pretty good. I've heard Strange Journey is really good. So yeah, a lot of handheld stuff. Anyways, Black Rock Shooter, having a good time with it. Hope to do a review of it in the future. Next up is a game that I was quietly hoping for would be good, considering the disappointment that its previous incarnation was, and probably to a lot of other fans like myself was disappointed with it, and that's Ninja Gaiden 3 Razor's Edge. Now, when this game was originally announced, I knew that it was kind of, I found it a very strange move that it was going to be a Wii U exclusive, which in my, all honesty, I kind of knew that was going to not last because, I mean, come on, it's a Ninja Gaiden game on a Nintendo console. And yes, I know the original Ninja Gaidens were on NES way, way back in the 80s, but let's be, let's be realistic here. An Emory game like this on a Nintendo console being a success... Come on, when was the last time that actually really happened last time around? The only times I can name off the top of my head, and even successful, like, good games, were Mad World and uh, probably Eternal Darkness on the GameCube, even though I haven't played that one. But at the same time, I'm just like, uh, there's no way. This has got to go multi-platform. And I played the previous incarnation, uh, or its original incarnation, of Ninja Gaiden 3, on the PS3 and 360, and... To bluntly put it, the game just kind of, well, sucked. I mean, it wasn't, okay, the game itself wasn't, like, it wasn't broken, like, it didn't, like, it wasn't, like, glitchy as all hell, and it did function just fine, it's just, there was just so little to the game there, it just didn't feel like it was worth playing at all. 
Not to mention, there was like only one wet. I felt like there was only one weapon, there was only one Nimpo spell. I mean, come on, folks. That's just... You're gonna get bored after using the same thing over and over and over and over again after only a couple of hours. I mean, sure, having a giant demon f uh, kill new killing dragon is cool to shoot out of your hands, but once that's the only thing you do for several hours on end, it can get really tiresome. And so, with Ninja Gaiden 3 Razor's Edge, I was like, okay, tech... Okay, Team Ninja, I will give you another chance. Please do not screw this up. And to be perfectly honest, I'm actually kind of impressed at how I am enjoying this one a lot more than I did its original form. And I kind of want to give Team Ninja the benefit of the doubt and say this is the game that they originally wanted to make. And they're using this as an apology and saying, look, we know we wanted to make a good game. We wanted to make a good Ninja Gaiden game. We wanted to put all this really cool stuff in it. All these alternate characters, all these weapons, and all this good stuff. And all these, and then like these good mechanics. I was like, but we, we had a deadline to meet. We had to cut so much stuff out. So this is the one, this is for the fans. And as someone who has enjoyed the previous Ninja Gaiden games, I've gone through Ninja Gaiden Sigma, Sigma 2, 2, and th uh, 3. And now this. Uh, I'm almost done with this one. I think I maybe have one about one hour left in this game. I'm not quite sure. And so I'm I'm fairly... I'm willing to forgive Team Ninja for this one. I know some people are not going to be as forgiving as I am. But given the fact that this... I would honestly say mechanics-wise, this is probably the best I've seen Ninja Gaiden so far. And so, like, more so than Sigma 2, which is my personal favorite. But, that being said, the story is a little bit mm, subpar, but with a Team Ninja game, what do you really expect? I mean, this isn't Shakespeare. So, that being said, I, I, if you're a Ninja Gaiden fan, uh, I would suggest checking out Razor's Edge. I'll, pro I'll do a full review on this one as well, after I get done with my other reviews, which I will mention at the later end of this video, so stick around for that. Anyways, Ninja Gaiden 3 Razor's Edge... Nice apology from Team Ninja, willing to forgive them for that, and I'm looking forward to finishing it. Next up is a game that I thought would never see the light of day in the US, and it is the final part of the Operation Rainfall trilogy, to me at least, and that is Pandora's Tower. Now, I, I'm i very pleased with XE Games, I mean, the, one, the company that has now released two-thirds of the trilogy, the last one being the last story, and so, with that said, I was very very glad the fact we get this one because this felt like the most niche of the RPGs and seemed like the least likely to be a release in the US. And so I've messed around with it. I think I'm about three or four is out four hours into this one, and I'm actually very intrigued by this RPG. I mean it's not the one game that keeps popping up in my head whenever I go through this game is Shadow of the Colossus. And the reason why I say this is because the basic story feels the same. Is that you're a young guy who basically goes to the ends of the earth, pretty much, to this barren wasteland to the like middle of nowhere, and you have to go out and slay these monsters in this specific location in order to uh, help your, I think, girlfriend or love interest. I'm not exactly sure what her relationship is with the guy, and in order to save her life. And so I was thinking to myself, this feels really, really strange, like strangely familiar to Shadow of the Colossus. And I gotta be honest, I'm actually surprised at how much I'm enjoying this one because the, it's not... The way the gameplay actually works is that you have this one little chain weapon. I love the fact that they're very inventive with this chain. Is that you can make it grapple onto certain surfaces, like you have to really use it to tra traverse the environment, sort of like a grappling hook. And, like, you can take a certain weapon that a character is holding and throw it at them. You can take the enemy themselves and throw them at other enemies. You can use it to traverse the environment by swinging on certain hooks or grabbing onto certain ledges. It's very, it's very creative and very uh, handy when it comes to using it during the gameplay. And they do find ways to make the actual boss battles more interesting and intense. Not to mention, this game is actually fairly fast-paced, which, which is something I don't normally see, because I know a lot of JRPGs, they usually feel like they have this very slow burn to them. And I'm okay with that as long as it keeps me intrigued, but the fact that this is a lot more fast-paced than most JRPGs I normally see is actually a nice surprise. And so, I'm actually looking forward to the rest of this story, and 
hopefully, if the story keeps me intrigued enough, I can give this a favorable review. But we'll see. It's still a little bit early. I'm only, like I said, I'm only about three or four hours in. So we'll just have to sit, wait and see what the game else is also like. But yeah, Pandora's Tower, I'm glad that it's here. Thank you, XC, for bringing this over, and I can't wait to see the rest of it. All right, now it's time for the movies that I got th this month. Now, I only got two movies this month, and thankfully both of them are really, really good movies. But there just really wasn't that many Blu-ray releases coming out this month, at least live-action movie-wise, that I was intrigued by. But the ones that are intrigued by are these. Now, this is one movie I saw a few months ago. I think it was back in January when Oscar season was rolling around. I, I think that was when it was going on. And I literally saw this at the last showing on the last day it was going to be in my local Dallas theater. And so I went out, I tried and hauled my hauled ass to the theater to get there as fast as I could to see the movie because I heard it was really, really good and the act and uh, Jennifer Lawrence won an Academy Award for Best Actress and so I went and saw it and it's Silver Linings Playbook. Now, and just like the Oscar gave given to her, I fully agree that she deserved it because she was fantastic in this movie. Now, now the basic plot of this, I mean, Bradley Cooper is trapped in... Um, is it gets out of a mental uh, institution where he's suffering from bipolar disorder. He's trying to get back together with his life and trying to get his life back together. And then she come, he comes across Tiffany, played by Jennifer Lawrence. And so he, they, the two kind of both have bipolar disorder. They're kind of bouncing off each other. And i got to say, this is probably one of the most interesting relationship dynamics I've ever seen in a movie. Because usually with... I personally can't stand romantic comedies because of how cheesy they are. I just... Something about him is very off-putting for me. But this one I was actually intrigued by because of the premise with it being involving bipolar disorder. And having having met a couple people who also suffer from this same disorder, it really it really gives a convincing idea. It sort of reminded me of um, Colin Firth in The King's Speech, where it's like, you were convinced that so much, like, the person gets so lost in the role, you almost forget the fact that the person doesn't actually have, like, a speech impediment with Colin First case. I mean, with Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence, I actually believe that they had a bipolar disorder in this one, and that just is a testament to their acting ability. And Robert De Niro, holy crap, he acted his ass off in this movie. I mean, everyone just did a great job in this. None of this movie felt cheesy or insane or unrealistic. I mean, on some level, you you applaud Bradley Cooper for the fact that he's trying to stay positive. He wants things to get better. He's trying to stay as upbeat as possible. And yet, in some ways, everyone kind of acts a little bit down. Everyone's trying to say, like, no, don't get too over the top. Don't get too crazy. And I can kind of sympathize with that. Like, for me, I don't try to be overly cynical. I don't try to be a stubborn curmudgeon or anything like that. I'm not saying anyone in this movie acts like that. But it seems like you can understand why. And then Tiffany, I mean, Jennifer Lawrence herself, holy crap, that girl is a good actress. I mean, I saw her, it, the first time I saw her was in Winter's Bone, and I was like, wow, this is a damn good actress. And then I saw her in Hunger, Hunger Games, and I loved it. And, I mean, hell, I saw it twice. So, and with this one, Silver Length Playbook, this is probably the best I've ever seen her. I hope she does other great movies like this or in the future. I can't wait to see her in Catching Fire as well. So, with that said, I'm really pleased with Silver Lining Playbook. I haven't had a chance to watch this on Blu-ray, so I can't comment on the picture quality yet, but I am looking forward to seeing this movie again, and it's one of those few movies that involve a romance that I actually believe works very, very well into the film's favor. So, if you have a chance to pick up Silver Lining's Playbook, I highly recommend doing so. It's a great movie. Next up is one of my favorite movies of last year, and I am so glad I picked this up. It is the new Quentin Tarantino film, Django Unchained. Oh, man. I actually, uh, I remember going to see this movie with my dad in the theater, and it was one of those experiences I was very, very worried of how my father was going to receive this movie, because I don't know if I've ever actually, I don't know if he's ever actually watched a Tarantino film before. I don't know, like, I don't remember if he has or not. And the only, and I have watched a couple of other Tarantino films. I've seen Pulp Fiction, I've seen Kill Bill, I've seen Inglorious Bastards. I haven't watched the rest of his stuff, like Reservoir Dogs, um, Death Proof, what else am, what am I missing? Oh, well, I'll, I'll figure it out a bit. Oh, yeah, Jackie Brown, True Romance, uh, there's probably one other film I'm missing. Anyways, 
Of all the movies I've seen of Quentin Tarantino, I would probably say this is one of my overall favorites, at least top two favorites. And the reason why I love this movie so much is pretty much the cast in this movie. I mean, with Jamie Foxx, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Christoph Waltz, I mean, can you really think of a cast that sounds more awesome than that? I mean, Christoph Waltz is probably... This is really hard to pick over my overall actor. That's my favorite. Sorry. An overall actor that's my favorite, I would probably say Christoph Waltz is my favorite. He's just so much fun to watch. I love just how well-spoken he is, and at the same time, he can just waltz right up into you and just shoot, go, shoot a bullet in your chest, but not a second thought. And yet, he acts like a gentleman pretty much the entire time. He's well-spoken, he's polite, he doesn't try, he never loses his cool. And he's, he's, it's just funny to see how everyone in this movie just seems like they're having a blast this whole time. And getting a whole, and just looking at the scenery and looking at how it makes fun and parodies all these little westerns and all these little references that Tarantino is known for. I mean, most of these references go right over my head. I don't, I personally do not know, and I'm not that familiar with westerns. But at the same time, as a movie, I just had a blast watching it with my dad. And it was funny because after the movie was over, I asked what he thought about it. And he said, uh, it was good, but I think Quentin Tarantino is a little bit uh, indulgent and he's, uh, it's not exactly realistic in terms of the bloodshed. And yes, it is very, very bloody. I mean, there's, I mean, I think during the last third of the movie, I think, geez, it basically turns into one giant bloodbath, and I personally had a lot of fun with it. I was laughing, I was pumped out of my mind, it was exciting, it was fun, and yes, it is unrealistic, but even so, I told my, after my dad said that, I told him, um, Dad, I think this is, a t this is a Tarantino movie. I think rule number one going into a movie like this, you need to throw realism out the window, and so... I, I had a lot of fun watching it. I've watched this thing. I think I've already watched this like three times on Blu-ray, and the picture quality looks great. It has a very nice, smooth smooth uh, cut, uh, look to it. I love how all the sharp little details where it's necessary. Everything looks very pristine, very well kept, and ha still has that bit of a grit to it. I mean, given the Western setting or Southern-ish setting, that's... I think that's a film like this is supposed to have the imagery, or at least have that idea. And Leonardo DiCaprio is the villain. I mean, holy crap, man. I mean, I I was never a kid. I mean, when I was a kid, I really didn't know who Leonardo DiCaprio was. Like, even after Titanic, I was like, well, who's that guy? I don't know who he is. But then I saw Inception, I was like, holy crap, it's that guy. And I really liked him as an actor. I thought he was great. I've had, and this is probably one of the most unexpected roles I've ever seen him take on. But at the same time, it's one of the best roles he's ever, I, I, he's ever taken on. It's one of those roles he gets so lost in and has so much fun with that you just can't help but go along for the ride and how just despicably unlikable he is and just how crazy he can be. At, at the same time, he's one of those villains you want to hate, but at the same time, you can't. Also, uh, Samuel L. Jackson just kills it in this movie. I mean, every single main actor or lead in this movie just knocks it out of the park. Jamie Foxx especially. I mean, he starts off as this very quiet, very subtle, humble slave who's freed, and now he turns into this badass gunslinger by the end. He just owns everybody, and it's so much fun. And I love the fact that Tarantino is so unapologetic in terms of his direction. He will just go balls out and just not not hold back in terms of subject matter. And I always appreciate directors or creators, writers, or any kind of uh, just person who is in media or an art form that just goes all out and doesn't say sorry for it and just says like, no, I'm going to make this my way and if you can't appreciate that, that's your problem. And I really respect Tarantino for that. So, I mean, I mean people, if you're a Tarantino fan, you'll probably already own Django Unchained. If you have not seen Django Unchained, I would recommend, I would definitely recommend seeing it. It's definitely a fun, to, fun movie. Just make sure that you have an iron stomach because there is a lot of blood in this movie. But I imagine if you can get past the bloodshed, you will end up laughing your ass off as I did. And I still laugh at this movie. I mean, ugh, just Django Unchained, kick-ass movie. I'm so glad I saw it. And now finally we get into my anime pickups for this year. And again, this is probably the one where it's 
tied with my games. There was only three things I really picked up, but the three I picked up, two of which I'm very, very excited for, and I'm glad I saw them. But this one is... This one I have... I have some hope that it's going to continue to be, or at least gets good, and that is, uh, is uh, Pat Labor, the original OVA series. This just came out today, released by Made in Japan, and uh, the reason why I picked this one up is because it has two names attached to it that are responsible for some of my all-time favorite films, Mamoru Oshii and Kenji Kawai, who are also responsible for Ghost in the Shells 1 and 2, two of my favorite movies ever made. And so... When I found out that they were also the ones responsible for this one, I mean, Kenji Kawai doing the soundtrack and directed by Mamoru Oshii, I was excited. I was like, sweet, get me on board with this. I want to see this. And I heard it's regarded as a classic, and so I picked it up today. I've already watched the first two OVAs. I watched the first two episodes, and I gotta say, it's not exactly as complex as I would have, or at least as I anticipated it would, because Ghost in the Shell was, to me, very, very philosophical, very interesting, and just thought-provoking. This one seems to focus more on the interpersonal relationships of the characters, and granted, I've only seen two episodes, so maybe it gets really, really good later on, but so far, the first two episodes are just not really that impressive so far, not to mention the character emotions that they exhibit in this show don't exactly seem to fit the situation. I mean, there's one scene in the second episode where there involves a bomb disposal or trying to uh, refuse a bomb, and this guy, like, and he clips through these wires, and he, like, you know the typical, like, which one is it, the blue wire or the red wire? I mean, everyone knows, it's always the red wire. And so, he breaks out in like, this cold sweat, and everyone's like, he has all the time in the world. It's like, dude, you got like five minutes. And he's just flipping out. It's like, which one is it? I don't know what to do. It's like, dude, just cut the red wire, dude. Just get rid of it. And so, he doesn't do it, and it turns out someone else does it. And it's just like, and all this, and this other girl, uh, the main character, Noah, I think, she starts, like, crying because the bomb doesn't go off. And I was like, what? What makes, what sense does that make? You should be, like, happy or something because the bomb didn't go boom and therefore you would not die. And I don't know. It's just kind of strange. It's, it just didn't seem to really make a lot of sense. I will admit the mech designs look really cool. And at the same time, I'm kind of curious. Why can't the mechs jump? I don't know why. Just, like, there's a certain scene in this movie that I just felt like was needlessly overcomplicated. I was like, can't you just do a running star and just jump? Oh, well, whatever. I'm complaining a little too much. Anyways, I hope that this I hope that this OVA gets better. I the first two episodes just haven't impressed me a whole lot, but I still have I still have faith in Mamoru Oshii and Kenji Kawai that they can deliver something really really good with this. I mean, if you like this one, that is perfectly fine. I just haven't been impressed enough yet, or just I haven't been I just I'm still mixed on this. I want to like this. I want to like the, what Oshii is doing, but at the same time, it's just not doing anything yet. So, I'll have to re watch the rest of it, but so far, it's kind of wait and see with Pat Labor. Next up is, oh, now here's a movie I can really get into and have a lot of fun with, and that is Howl's Moving Castle. Now, I actually picked this up off of CD Japan. It was the only one left in stock, and this is, without a doubt, one of my favorite movies ever made. I mean, I love Studio Ghibli. I love their work. I love Miyazaki's style, and he's one of the few directors, I would say, I wouldn't really call Miyazaki an anime director. I would call him a director that knows how to use animation to its fullest advantage in terms of conveying emotion, conveying a story, conveying artistry, and just the pure visual beauty of the meat of the genre and the style. And Howl's Moving Castle to me is one of his best, if arguably his best. I, personally, my favorite is Spirited Away out of his work. I haven't seen a lot of his uh, some of his other stuff like. Um, my Neighbor Totoro, for example, but I have seen uh, Kiki's Delivery Service. That was the first one I ever saw. Spirited Away, Howl's Moving Castle, Princess Mononoke. Uh, I haven't watched Ponyo yet. I do have it, but I just haven't had a chance to watch it. Um, what else? What am I missing? Oh, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. That's also one of my favorites. Uh, pretty much all of his stuff that I've read, except for Kiki I've seen so far, all ranks in some way are like my top 30 movies ever made. I just love his style, I love his work, and just like I mentioned with Silver Linings Playbook, this is one of the few where I actually feel like the romance between, um, 
Sophie and how it actually works. Now, the blue, this is actually the Blu-ray itself, and the picture quality of this looks outstanding. I mean, I already had the film on DVD, and then I, when I found, I found it was going to be released on Blu-ray. I think it's going to be, I think it's supposed to be released this May. I think I'm not quite sure about that off the top of my head. But then I was like, you know what? I don't, I haven't bought anything off CD Japan yet, so I'm going to give this a shot and test it with this. And so when I watched Hell, I was like, how can you take a visually stunning and spectacular movie and make it better? Simple. Put it in high definition. I'm serious. They took a visual masterpiece and made it better. I was just like, whoa. And just seeing just the colors and the vibrancy and the detail that they put into this movie, I was like, They're, they did not screw around with this movie. And just seeing that, I was just like, ah, oh, now I remember why this movie is one of my favorites. I just have so much fun with it. It actually conveys a really good message of how to accept someone even at their most ugly moments and just having faith in what they can, and believing that they can overcome a certain obstacle and their own vanity. I just love Howl's Moving Castle. I know a lot of people do. So if you have not a chance to pick to watch it, please, please watch Howl's Moving Castle. It is a great, great movie. I mean, if even if you're not into anime at all, if you think it's really stupid or silly, I, I recommend at least this movie. I mean, Spirited Away, Howl's Moving Castle, Princess Mononoke, just watch Miyazaki stuff. Please watch it. It is so, so good. Just the stories, the characters, and even the voice acting, too. I mean, I watched this with the English dub version, and I know a lot of people are very stingy with dubs, and I get that, but I had no idea that Christian Bale did the voice for Hal in, this, in the English dub version. I mean, when I saw his name on the credits for the first time, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Batman did the voice for Hal, and so... I don't know why, I just had a fun idea of popping in my head and trying to pretend like it was the Batman voice for Hal, and just had a, got a little chuckle out of that. But that being said, it just shows that he gets so lost in the role that you just don't even see Christian Bale in the voice booth anymore. You see Hal, you see the voice of Hal, and the character, and it's just really, really good, and that just shows him the quality of Christian Bale as an actor. I mean, the guy, he can go crazy, he can go do any role, like he can go to crack down, washed up, has been fighter in, in the fighter, to Batman, to this, I mean, that just shows the guy that has range, and he's one of my favorite actors, so yeah, Hell's Moving Castle, if you have not a chance to pick, pick this up on Blu-ray when it comes out, I think this may, but if you can, if you want to go ahead and import it, I got this off scene in Japan, you can probably get it for a pretty good price, and just go ahead and watch it. It is so worth your time. It is one of my favorite movies ever made. And finally, it is the only DVD I, I I think it's the yeah it's the only DVD I have this time around. But it's ironically probably my favorite thing I have seen recently. And besides like actual TV series wise or OVAs, and it is Armitage Three: The Complete Series. Now. I've actually come to the realization that cyberpunk is probably my favorite genre in science fiction and probably my favorite overall genre. And this show, and not to mention other shows like Ghost in the Shell, are reasons why I love it. Because it combines a lot of different things I really like, or at least things I find to be very, very interesting. Which is a good female protagonist, a cyberpunk aesthetic that seems believable, but not, it seems, it may seem futuristic looking, but it never seems impossible for it happening. But it also combines an interesting philosophical and ethical dilemma. And with Armitage, in Armitage 3, I really, really loved it. I mean, yeah, I've only seen the OVAs so far. I have not watched Polymatrix or Dual Matrix yet. But after I saw the first episode of uh, Armitage, I just fell in love with the show. I mean, and there were certain lines in that in those shows that I was just like, yes! I mean, I was literally cheering when I was watching. I was like, yes! That is how you do it. That's how you get me in tree. You present an interesting philosophical and ethical dilemma. And uh, let, uh, let me just go ahead and set up a little bit. Is that it follows a character named Ross Silvas who, this, who comes from Earth and has now become part of the Martian Police Department. And he's partnered up with a young lady by the, by the name of Armitage, Naomi Armitage. And she is, what you find out is that she is what's known as a third, or a specific kind of robot. And she is a third, a third is 
kind of special. I will, I'll say that it's kind of special from a second, from a uh, from a typical android called a second. And the re what makes the third so special is a very very specific reason. And I won't spoil what that reason is, but trust me, I'm doing this for your benefit because I am imploring you, if you love philosophical and ethical dilemmas, if you like shows that make your brain kind of just go, wow, I really need to analyze this and think about what's the real concern, if this is a good thing, if this is a bad thing, I, uh, I want to say the line that just, that, that just presented this really interesting dilemma, and uh, seriously, just watch Armitage, it's so, so good, and I've come to realize that if it has this combination of a good female protagonist, a good cyberpunk setting, and an interesting physical, uh, philosophical dilemma, I'm usually very on board with this immediately. And Armitage is without a doubt one of the best animes I've seen in a long while. Probably the one of the best I've seen since Ghost in the Shell, since Gordon Lagan. It's just so much, so interesting to watch. To and. Let me, actually, I'll go ahead and just describe the conflict a little bit, just a little bit. What I like about this series, or at least the OVAs, is that unlike Ghost in the Shell, which focuses more on the humanity aspects, like the blurring the lines between human and machine, what makes us human, the curiosity that everyone exhibits, is that what is that it shows curiosity in its most primal form, and that's why I like Matoko so much, is because to me she is like the ultimate incarnation of the human most core human virtue, or at least ideal, which is curiosity. This presents a more racially sensitive type of angle. Like, it takes the idea of what would happen if robots and humans coexisted with each other, but instead of, like, there being, like, it all existing in harmony, there was a lot of, like, racial tension and a lot of animosity towards robots. Um, and so what this show does is that it presents it full force, and it pres and the then the added dilemma that they added with Armitage herself involving what she is and what she's capable of doing, it makes it all the more interesting and possibly even scary for us humans. But the way that they present it is so interesting and good, and I love the way it wraps itself up. I love the questions it asks. I love the like the just the ethical, the philosophical angles that it takes, and so I highly recommend Armitage 3. If you have not seen it, if you're into cyberpunk, if you love good, thought-provoking shows, I highly recommend this one. Definitely one of the best I've seen in a long, long while. Alright now, everybody, just like I said at the beginning of this video, I do have a couple of announcements waiting. Number one, I'm actually on Twitter now, so I'm going to put go ahead and put my Twitter name here at the bottom of the screen so you can follow me. Uh, I'm going to put, post a little bit of updates there so that way you know what videos I'm working on and what I'm currently doing in progress of making them. I just feel like I understand that I'm not the most punctual reviewer as I said before my last video and I would like to be able to keep you constantly updated or at least frequently updated about what I'm doing, what's going on with me and the reason why I'm telling you this is because finals week are, are coming up for me and so I will not be able to post any other videos Probably after this, well, I'm, I'm going to try to do my StarCraft 2 review, my God of War Century review, and my Bioshock Infinite review this week. I will try and get those done for you out there so that way you have something to watch. But after that, I will not be able to do another video for at least a good maybe week and a half or so or two weeks. And, because, and it's because I need to study for finals and I need to focus and have my priorities focus on school first and foremost like I have done so far. So I just want to let you know that ahead of time. But if you follow me on Twitter, I can keep you constantly updated on what I am doing, what progress I am making with my games and with my movies that I am watching. Also, another update number uh, announcement number two. I have gotten a lot of requests ever since I did my Man of Steel trailer reaction uh, that a lot of people are saying, oh, you need to watch this Superman stuff, like, you need to watch Smallville, the animated series, the Reeve films, I mean, it's just like, just this hailstorm of Superman content that I need to watch. And so, I am going to make this announcement right now. During the, during this summer, I don't know exactly when, I haven't set a set date for it, but I am going to do a Superman-related marathon. I am going to re probably review the first two Christopher Reeve films. I am going to probably uh, I'm going to try to review the animated series Smallville if I can, if I can squeeze enough time in for that, because that's going to take a while. Um, I'm going to try to review some of the other animated films like Superman vs. the Elite and All Star Superman. 
Uh, what else? At, but I will do this after I've seen Man of Steel. I want to go into Man of Steel cold and not knowing much about the lore of Superman. So once I see Man of Steel, then I will try to get that review up as soon as I see the film. Like literally, I will come back to my apartment. I will watch the. I will watch the film. I'll come back to my apartment, press record, and get started, and just go right at it. And so. I'll try to review that one, but after I've seen Man of Steel, I will do a Superman-related marathon. If you guys have any other suggestions for what I should review during the Superman marathon, please let me know. I would like to do this. I want to have fun with this idea. I want you to have fun watching it and just enjoy the overall idea as someone like me who is not familiar with Superman to get exposed to the character more and understand it. And announcement number three is that during at the end of this uh, at the end of May I will be at Acon, so I am going to be just browsing around, probably hang out with a couple of friends, and just chilling out and seeing what goes on. Like maybe go to a couple panels or so, just drop in and maybe see what's going on in the world of anime. Probably bounce around the dealers room, see what's available, see if there's any cool rare stuff that I can pick up and find. Um, but if any of you, if any of you, my viewers or subs happen to be down in the Dallas area or coming into the Dallas area for that convention, please stop by and try and find me. I mean, I always love meeting new fan, meeting new people, and meeting people and just seeing like what they like and why are they there. Or I mean, I just want to have a good conversation going between us and just have fun with it. And so I'll be down at Acon. It'll be at the end of May. So if you're going to be down there, please feel free to talk to me. I welcome you. I love to talk to you and have a good time. So everybody, I think that is all my updates and my pickups for this month, uh, uh, April 2013. And so I hope you enjoyed this little update. And tell me, what did you pick up during this month? And tell me, what was your favorite thing you've watched or taught or played this watched played or have uh, come across this month or in recent memory? So. Comment below and tell me what you think. And so, until next time, I'm Perry the One-Armed Legend. You name it, I can play it.